I'd like to welcome you to ECE 341 Random Processes. Throughout the semester, we'll divide our lectures into two parts, uh, part one followed by part two. This is the first lecture of part one. So to get us started this semester, I'd like to cover some basic um, set notation, set terminology, um, set manipulation. Uh, this will lay the framework for later being able to compute probabilities. The first idea or first topic uh, term that we'll look at is this idea of a set. A set is a collection, often unordered, of objects, and those objects we oftentimes call the elements. We'll use curly braces when we're trying to represent sets, and so we'll go ahead and just provide a couple simple examples of this as well as some alternate representations. Let's look at a set A1. So I'm going to go ahead and put A1. We'll use an equal sign um, so we can create um, this set through a mathematical expression. And then I'm going to use the curly bracket. That curly bracket is going to let us know that we're talking about a set. And then I'm going to have in here an X, and I'll put a couple of dots. And I'm going to go ahead and say X greater than minus 1. And I will also have X less than equal to 1, something along those lines. So if I was going to read this out, I would say A1 equals the set of elements X such that X is greater than minus 1 and X is less than or equal to 1. So we're looking at numbers, if you will, on the, the real number line uh, that are between minus 1 and 1, where we don't include minus 1, but we do include 1. Um, I can get a graphic of this, and so that might be useful in just understanding what this A1 looks like. So if I go ahead and just draw um, a, a number line here, so I could be thinking of values of x, and we know that there's a boundary point here at minus 1, and there's another boundary point of 1. We are not including minus 1, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that as an open circle. We are including 1, so I'll go ahead and make that a closed circle, and then we're including everything in between it. So I'm going to make that as a dark, heavy line, something like that. That dark, heavy line that's given in there, right, um, is letting me know that this set A1, so if I went ahead and part, kind of uh, put an arrow towards that, I just say A1, that A1 is a set of all elements going from minus 1, not inclusive, right, up through and including the element um, or value 1. So that's one example of a set. Sets don't have to be numerical. We could have other kinds of sets, so let me come up with a different one. A2 could be the set that includes just two elements. So in this particular case, I'm going to say there's the idea of a cat and there's the idea of the dog. So in this particular case, you don't see a number. You don't see a numerical value in there, um, but there's still two objects, right? You have a cat and a dog. So in this particular set, only two items, and neither of them has a, a number associated with it. We could certainly come up with other ones. Uh, let's try this one. A3 is equal to a set of professors, right? So I'm going to go ahead and look at the set of professors. Uh, we know that there's a universe of professors out there. And we're going to be looking at the set of professors with how about um, IQs, IQs um, greater than 80 something along those lines. So that's a different kind of set, right? Um, it does have a, a collection of objects that are indicated through the description in that set. Um, but perhaps in this particular case, uh, it certainly doesn't. Um, it doesn't tell you exactly every single element that's in there. You would have to apply a further test maybe to decide whether or not um, a particular professors met or didn't meet this particular criteria. There is a, another topic or another uh, terminology called the null set. Um, we are going to identify that with this null character, which I've just highlighted. Um, and this is a set that contains no objects or elements. And it is kind of a quirky thing, but uh, the null set is contained in all sets. So no matter what set you pick up um, or what set you can imagine, the null set is considered uh, an element of those sets. And so um, you might go back to that set A3, something along those lines, right? If we could sit there and say A3, we had already looked at that A3, right, is equal to the set of professors, right? We could look at that set of professors um, with IQs greater than 80. Um, a way you might continue this is you could say, is that equal? And I'll put a little question mark above this. I'll let you decide, is it equal? Or we could say, is it not equal to uh, something like the empty set? If you believe there's no professor out there with an IQ greater than 80, well, then that set A3 would be the empty set, right? So empty set is that set that contains nothing. Um, if we continue this a little bit, we can add an additional uh, character or a pair of characters that will help us know whether something is contained in or an element of a set. So um, in this particular case, I'm going to introduce this kind of E and the E with a slash through it. So we're going to use that um, script E, that script E with a slash to indicate whether something is or isn't an element of a set. Um, so uh, they will oftentimes talk about this as being is a member of or is not a member of, or they might say is an element of or is not an element of, right? If I was going to use this in context with that A3, we know that I am a professor, for example, so um, there is Roger. And so we could sit there and say, is Roger, right, an element of, right, A3? Or is it possible that Roger is not an element of A3? 
If you think my IQ is uh, greater than 80, well, then I would be an element of A3. If you think my IQ is less than 80, well, then I probably have a problem there, and I'm not going to be an element of A3. So this is just a shorthand notation. A lot of this mathematical notation just allows us a way of coming up with descriptions of things of interest that can be written compactly. There is a concept called the universal set. That's the thing we'll talk about next. Uh, we'll almost always use uh, a large capital S to indicate the universal set. The universal set is the set of all objects of interest or of relevance uh, to a particular application. You can call it the universe that is relevant to that particular application. Um, these ideas of universes uh, vary. They change based on application. Um, the universe here doesn't mean the universe um, is the same for every single uh, different thing you can imagine. The universe just changes based on the context or the particular application that you're looking at. So some examples of this. Um, you could think of something like rolling a six-sided die. We could look at this idea or an experiment. We could roll a six-sided die, right? You could do something like that, roll a six-sided die, and we're interested in what comes up on that die. So our universe here is all involving this rolling a single six-sided die. And if it's a standard die, right, we know that there's six outcomes possible on there. It could be a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And so our universe in that particular case, the S, right, is the set that is going to be all the possibilities of outcome. What is showing up on that, on that face-up die um, It's going to be a one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? So in this particular experiment, um, the object of interest is uh, what did we just roll with a single six-sided die? And we know that there's six outcomes and we enumerate all of them. This gives us an ability to see everything that is possible within this universe. And that is called the universal set. Um, we could do other kinds of universal sets. For example, you might do something like this. The universal set could be um, the set of all real numbers as an example, right? So if we were going to be um, uh, looking at an application that maybe uh, runs along the entire uh, real number lines, uh, using the real numbers as being our universe of interest would uh, certainly be appropriate in those kind of cases. You could have a set, a universal set, that could be the set of all complex numbers, so all complex numbers. And there's some shorthand notations for this. Sometimes they'll do the reals just as this kind of fancy script RE, and sometimes they'll do this set of complex as being this kind of fancy C, and um, I don't know, they don't usually um, uh, do anything after that, so they would just usually leave it as a script C. So in these particular cases, you might have a universe of interest, objects of interest that either are on the real number line, or it could be in a complex uh, kind of Cartesian plane, something along those lines. The universal set has to be able to include everything of potential interest. The idea of subsets um, is something along the following lines. If an object in a particular set A um, are also found in a set B, then A is considered a subset of B. So you have to take everything that is in A, and if you find it um, that all of those things are also in a set B, then we would say A is a subset of B. So a subset is kind of like a, a small portion of another set, and it has to have everything um, that was part of that set included in the, in the larger one to be contained. Again, we have some notation to represent this compactly um, mathematically. Um, we're going to use this sort of um, uh, C or backward C looking characters um, to indicate whether something is a subset of. Um, you might consider these as also uh, being used to, to indicate whether something is contained in another. So uh, the C here is a mnemonic, some way of kind of remembering it. That C might mean contained, right? So subsets are a form of containment, you know, whether one set is contained in another. Um, we could look at some examples of this as, as well. Um, so you might uh, sit there and think of something like this. I could have something like a set A. Um, if we can get this guy to go, we could think of something like A1, right, as being equal to, let's say, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. And I could look at A2 as being equal to the set 3, just a single thing in there, something along those lines. Now, um, we can see that everything that is in A2 is also in A1. And so I certainly could sit there and say that A2 is a subset of A1. If I was going to do that mathematically, I would say something like this. I could say that A2, right, is contained in A1. And the way you might remember this as well, so you know which, which of those two versions, the C or the backward C you do, is that whichever way that C is opening up, it opens up to the bigger thing, right, to the, to the larger thing. A1 here is the larger thing. Um, so if I have A2 is contained in A1, A2 is a subset of A1, right, we could use 
use um, of this notation here, A2, and then we use that contained in or as a subset of A1 notation. I could just as equally um, write this out some way like this. I could put the A1 on the left-hand side, and I could say A1 contains A2. Really, this is an equivalent kind of statement, right? It's still saying A2 is a subset of A1, um, really no problem in there, uh, and, and, we're, and we're able to represent it in either way. Um, if I take a look at set equality, um, set equality is a way of saying whether a set A is equivalent um, or equal to a set B. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to say A is equal to B if and only if, and so if you've never seen that notation before, this IFF is just a common mathematical uh, shorthand for saying if and only if. So A equals B if and only if, right, um, this set A is contained in B, but also that B is contained in A. Um, so A has to be fully contained in B, and B has to be fully contained in A. If I looked at that last example that we did, A was 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And A2 was 3. We saw that A2 was a subset of A1, but A1 is not a subset of A2, and therefore we can say that those two sets are not equal. Um, a note here, order of elements is unimportant uh, to these sets in general. And so when we talk about this equality, um, it doesn't really matter which way um, the elements are, are listed. So for example, if I did an A was equal to the set of numbers 1, 2, and 3, right? And I had B as being equal to the set of numbers 3, 2, 1, right? We do see that A contains B, and we do see that B contains A, which I could have also written as having A on the left, right, and made the contain sign backwards um, so that A is still containing B. Either one of those would be the same because both of those are true. This implies that A equals B, and we can certainly see that. The three elements in A are shared as the same three elements of B. They did not have to be at the same um, kind of ordering in their in their listing. Let's go ahead and take a look at some operations on or between sets um, that can help us create new sets. Um, so much in this class is starting out with simple principles and then um, using sets of rules, simple rules oftentimes, um, to manipulate those um, earlier sets of things and make more complicated items out of that. So if we can get some basic operations, we can take potentially um, rel relatively simple sets and we can create more interesting um, or complicated um, variants of those guys. To help us understand these operations, I'm going to do some graphical um, uh, representations in addition to the mathematics. We definitely need to handle the mathematics, but I would like to introduce this idea of a graphical way of representing sets, um, subsets, and their relationships. And that's an idea of something called a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram is just a visual aid in depicting relationships between sets. And so um, we're going to go ahead and, and start out with a Venn diagram that's going to help us understand a couple of sets that are part of the universe. And then as we start looking at some operations that we might do on those sets, will also describe those operations in terms of the Venn diagrams. So let's go ahead and try to create a Venn diagram that represents two sets, A and B, as well as the universe S that contains them. So usually when we do a Venn diagram like that, we usually represent, whoops, I'm going to make that into actually a, uh, I'm going to see if I can make that guy into a into a just a, a pen. Um, we usually make that universe um, as something that might be just a bounded area, a bounded box. I usually use just a, a rectangles in there, something like that. So that box and everything inside of it, right? That box there is my S. So that's a representation of my universe, everything that's in this universe. This is an abstract concept at this point, okay? Um, it's a way of visualizing sets, subsets, and their, and their interrelationships. Um, I also know that I've got some set A that is part of my universe. It's going to have to be part of my universe. If you have some experience or some experiment or some sort of situation of relevance, anything that you can imagine has to be a part of the, part of the universe. So I'm going to just go ahead and draw in there um, some part of that rectangle. I'm going to show it as a circle here, and I'm going to call that a sub set A. So A is a subset of S. In fact, any, any set that you can dream up should be a subset of the universal because this universe um, is as big as we can get for a particular application. I'm going to have another set B um, just to kind of indicate that it's different. I'm going to use a different shape. And in this particular case, I'm going to draw it with some potential overlap in, in this space. So B right comes in there and it overlaps a bit with that A, at least graphically. Now it is possible, even though I've drawn it with that overlap, we could assign that area of overlap as being the empty set, which would mean that they weren't overlapped at all. Um, I think in general, though, we would like to try to show as many different possible um, combinations or situations as possible with these Venn diagrams. 
So this will get us started. So I have a universe S represented by that rectangle. I've got a subset in it, um, an object of interest, if you will, or a set of interest. I'm going to call that A, that's that circle. And then I've got that other one, the rectangle B, um, neither of which is, uh, at least by this diagram's um, visual appearance, uh, as large as S, but they're a part of S and they do have some overlap. Okay, now I think we're ready to start talking about some set operations. There is an operation called a union. Um, we end up designating this or, or representing it. You have a set A and you have a set B, and if you want to take the union, you just put a U between those two. So it's a, it's not quite an actual U. It will look more um, kind of like a um, upside down contained sign. So it's a, it's a mathematical symbol. You'll see this when we actually send out the homework. Um, it's, it's not quite the letter, but it looks a lot like the letter U, um, and they, they um, use this to designate this union operation. So A union B is how I would read this. A union B is a set, it's a new set, right, generated from A and B, and it contains objects from A or from B or from both. A union is a lot like a logical or, and it's sometimes depicted in that way. So we can think, even though this is maybe a little bit of an abuse of having some set A and some set B, and they're going through some sort of oring operation. I, I use this for electrical engineering um, audiences because um, almost everybody at this point has gone through a class like digital. And if we talk to objects that were ones or zeros, um, this logical or uh, works very much like this idea of a union. And so we could also represent what comes out of there not as an AUB, AUB, we could write it as an A plus B be kind of that or operation if we were going to follow um, maybe some earlier um, digital um, digital logic type of theory. In a more mathematical set notation, uh, we can do it like this. We can say that the union between A and B is a set, right? It's a set of elements X such that, that's what the two dots means, X is an element of A or X is an element of B. So it could be either of those two. Right? Something along those lines. Let's look at that idea of a union with a Venn diagram. I'm going to go back and take a look at what I had before. In fact, I can go ahead and maybe grab this guy. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this guy just so we have a, an accurate starting comp uh, um, picture of this guy. I'll go in here and, and go ahead and duplicate that guy out. And then I'm going to drag it down and, and place it in here, something like that. So here's our original Venn diagram. And I want to find out what is this union, something along those lines. Let's use a different color. So I'm going to go ahead and let um, there be a new set. Set, right? And I'm going to call this guy D for fun. D is equal to A union B. And I would like to go ahead and indicate that D set um, through some red in this particular diagram. Well, it could be anything from A, right? So I'm going to come in here and shade in anything that was from A, right? Or it could be anything from B. And so I can come in there and I can certainly shade B, right? Something along those lines. Or it could have been in both A and B, which we've already done. And that's that double hatched area, which I'm now going to make extra dark. Anything here that's got that red, right, is going to be that idea of this set D, which is A union B. If I was being absolutely particular about this, maybe I would also do something like this. Maybe I would put a solid red line around the boundaries. Usually we use solid lines to indicate inclusion of. So let me go ahead and do that. And if I was going to um, maybe uh, show this in a finalized form, maybe I would just color it in dark all the way across, right? Do this dark all the way across to indicate what is this union uh, between these two objects, A and B. And what we get is we get this uh, kind of object here, right, that almost looks like a, a kind of a sad dog. It's got a little rectangular body and a circular head. And that is our D, right, and this union between A and B, something along those lines. It could be either in A or in B or in both, right? Any one of those would work. So that's a graphical depiction of the union. Um, we have the mathematical kind of representation up here. And we can also end up doing this more just from like, you know, physical set type of ideas. For example, if I had an A being equal to the set one, one, um, let's get this guy uh, put in here, one, two, and three, right? And I say B is equal to something. How about let's do three and four? And I want A union B in this particular case. What do I get? Could be anything from A. So A has one, two, and three, and it could be anything from B, which is three. Well, we've already included three. No need to re repeat it. It's already been included. Or four. And so that A union B would be one, two, three, four. Anything that could be either of those two. The only one that's common to both would be the three, right? But we include all those extra elements as well. If I look at an intersection, that's the next kind of mathematical operation we're going to talk about between sets. I would have A intersect B. This is a new set then that is um, the objects that are common to both A and B. So you have to be both, both part of A and both part of A 
and B, um, something along those lines. If I wanted to do kind of a digital systems analogy to this, um, an intersection is a lot like a logical and, and it's oftentimes or sometimes depicted as such. So I could have my set A and my set B feeding into this kind of set and gate, and what comes out is A and B. Um, notice that sometimes uh, we represent that intersection as an upside down U, okay, or we can do it as a dot, and sometimes we just even leave it without anything, just A times B, you might have AB. And the implication or assumption there is that that would be an intersection. If I was going to do this in a more mathematical set type notation, A intersect B is the set of elements X such that X is an element of A and simultaneously A is an L or X is an element of B. And I mentioned this already before, sometimes that intersection can just be shorthand to AB. Um, we'll see that probably more so when we start talking about probabilities. Again, we can we can make a, a, a view of this graphically using a Venn diagram. So let's go back up and grab that original Venn diagram so I don't have to recopy it in there. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this guy. And uh, once it gives me a chance to do it, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this guy. And we'll drag her down there and start working with it and see if we can do this, um, this idea of an intersection. Let's move it over here, something like that. So I'm going to create a new set. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do this in, let's say, green. So I'm going to call this a set E. E is going to be A intersect B. So you have to be both part of A and part of B. We know what A is. So I'm going to do this in, in, in maybe um, a different color. I'm going to do this in yellow for right now. So I'm going to go ahead and think about here's what A is, right? And then I'm going to look at what B is. I'm going to cross hatch that guy in a different direction. And what the rule says is that you have to be in both A and B. That's the area of overlap. So I have to have cross, cross hatching going in both directions, right? And if I look at that, that's pretty easy to identify. That's this little wedge piece that I've got in here and everything inside of it, something like that. So I'll go ahead and, and just hard shade it like that. So this intersection, right, is never going to be bigger than either A or B, okay? It could be as small as the empty set. There might be nothing common to the two, um, but it's never going to certainly be bigger than A or B. The intersection has to include um, only those items that are common to both. If I did um, my continuation of those previous sets that I looked at with the union, I can have that A being equal to, what was it? One, two, three, and B was equal to three and four, something like that. And if I wanted to look at A intersect B in that particular case, what element or elements are common to both sets? Well, we can see that that's just a single element, three. If there was no element, you'd get the null set, right? Um, and at most, you could get either A or B um, uh, out of that uh, if, we, if we were going to work on that. Some other kind of Venn diagrams that you might consider in here, um, we haven't drawn them as such, but it is possible conceivably instead of that interior where I've got a, you know, a circle and a, and a rectangle kind of overlapping like that, you might get something like this. You might have that universe sitting in there, something like that. B might be a bigger object, and A might be a subset of B, something along those lines, right? So you might have A fully contained in B, in which case the intersection is going to be what? That is just going to be A. Um, everything in A is also in B, so the intersection would just give us back A. Um, and it could have those roles reversed. You could have a rectangle inside a circle and, and so forth. You could also have a Venn diagram that showed no overlap, right? So I could have that circle over here and this uh, rectangle over here indicating that they have nothing in common, right? Um, um, there's nothing that's part of A that's also part of B. The intersection there would be the null set, um, something along those lines. There's an operation called a complement. Um, this is not like uh, telling someone they're great. That's a complement with an I. This is complement, um, and we notate that with a superscript C. So a complement is designated A raised to the, and there's a little C there. Um, these are all objects in the universe that are not in A. If I want to do this with a basic set notation, I would say that a complement right, is equal to the set of elements X such that X is not an element of A. So everything outside of A, um, but that is also still in our universe. Again, we can visualize this with our Venn diagrams. I'll go back up and I'll grab that original Venn diagram. I'll bring it down in there. So I'm going to go ahead and take a copy of this guy, duplicate it over, and we'll be able to uh, uh, drag this guy down. So let's go ahead and duplicate that and bring it down forward for doing our picture down here for the complements, something along those lines. So I'm going to drop this guy in place and let's go ahead and look at something like um, oh, let's do this next one. We'll do it in green again. Um, whoops, I didn't want to make that whole thing green. I want to make my, my pen stuff that I'm going to do in here green. So, whoops, boy, I'm really making this strange. Let's go ahead and copy that back over and make it black. And then we're going to go back to my pen and we're going to talk about um, 
a new set. Let's call this guy F for fun. F is just going to be a complement. So everything outside of A. We see A. A is that whole circle, right? And everything on the inside is the indication there, because I could have done that with some sort of shading. And A complement. Everything outside of A, right? Um, uh, but is also an S, would look something like this. And I'm not going to want to go through and, and, and shade this in um, hard. So I'm just going to use a crosshatch, and that would be fine on homework and then stuff like that. So just anything outside of that circle is going to be my complement. You can see here that sometimes that includes some stuff from B, right? Sometimes it includes some stuff that's neither part of A nor B. Um, and then there's um, never a time, though, where it includes any part of A. Um, and that includes even that part where A and B have overlap. So what I've shaded here in green would be that A complement as an example. I could also do something um, like the following. Let's make a, a different color in here. So let's go ahead and make this red. And so the next letter in the alphabet, let's go ahead and do a G. And let's let G be equal to what? Let's look at A intersect B. That's something we had looked at before. And then complement that result, right? What was A intersect B? That was that little wedge here that we had indicated in green. Right. So if I go back there and I take everything outside of that, I'm going to just do this in, in red so I can use the same diagram here if I'm a little bit careful. And so I'm going to go ahead and just start including everything in there. But, oh, I don't want to include that little wedge. Right. And so um, I'm going to just go ahead and keep doing that in there, something along those lines and keep going on and 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 on. So everything that is outside of that little wedge. Now I suppose if I was being careful in both of these cases, I probably would want to use a dotted line for the boundary. So let me clean these guys up in both cases. I'm going to draw like a little mini picture in here and just see if we can get these guys. So in the case of the first one, we had A complement. That was everything outside of A. A was a circle, right? And we can't include the circle. So I could draw that circle in a dotted line. I'm not including that boundary. And then everything outside of that guy, right, is going to be is going to be included. So my A complement could be something like that, where it would be all shaded in green outside. But then we're going to use that dotted line um, to indicate that the boundary is not included, right? The boundary was included as part of A, and so A complement would not include that boundary. If I was going to do the same sort of thing for this, in this next case where I take A intersect B complement, something along those lines, you could look at that guy. We know that A intersect B was that wedge because we're looking at everything outside of that guy, right? We would end up going and having that kind of wedge piece in a dotted line, right? And then we would want to shade everything else. Maybe I can do that with a highlighter. We'll see if this works or not. I don't know if this is going to be... Um, that maybe will work a little bit in there. So everything outside of that, right, up to but not including that boundary um, would be that G, something along those lines. So if you're going to do these like with um, particular attention to being absolutely accurate, you might have to be a little bit careful on things like boundaries as to whether you include them or not. The next one that we're going to look at is the idea of the difference. Um, many of you probably have seen uh, some of these set operations before in other classes um, or other applications. Difference is one that we certainly can do. It's not as common as a, as a kind of a standard uh, set operation, but it's certainly one we can visualize. So we're going to define the difference between A and B as A minus B. And this is one where the order matters, right? Um, the previous ones, A union B or A intersect B or a complement of those guys, it doesn't matter what order you do it. A minus B has an importance on the order. A minus B is not in general equal to B minus A. So how do I define this difference A minus B? A minus B are the elements of A that are not in B. Okay, so that's like an English language one. If I was going to do this in a mathematical set notation, I'd say the difference between A and B, A minus B, is the set of elements X such that, right, X is an element of A and X is not an element of B. We could write that in a little bit more compact way using stuff we'd already learned before, which is one reason why difference maybe isn't as common, because we can handle it just using things like intersects and complements. It's really nothing more than A intersecting B complement. It's everything in A and not and. So A and, the intersect is an and, right? Not B. So B complement, something along those lines. Again, I can visualize this with a Venn diagram. I'll go back up to the top, grab my Venn diagram so that we can bring it down and, and work with that guy. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a copy of this guy and a duplicator down so that we can um, uh, work with this without redrawing it totally over. So bring it down there. We're going to just drop this Venn diagram in there right like that. So let's go ahead and take a look. I think we were uh, previously up around G, so let's go with H. Let's do it in not 
that part, but let's do a pin here is blue. So let's let H right, be equal to A minus B, which I know is equal to what? This is A intersect B complement. One way of doing this, a nice way, is to break this down piece by piece. Piece. What is A? I can do that in a blue cross hatching in a particular way, something like that. So there's my A. What is B complement? Um, I could do that if you wanted in another way. Um, I could come over here and maybe do this in green. So I'm going to do B complement in here. So I'm going to come in here and get everything outside of B. Be a little careful as I come in here on this boundary. And you might have to think a little bit on the boundaries. These cross hatchings don't really help you maybe um, with precision do those boundaries. So you might have to think a little bit hard as to whether you use a solid or or a dotted line after you're done with that. So I'm going to have something like that. And because I have an intersection here, right, that 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 um, intersection, which is like an and, I have to look at where I get shading that is both green and blue here, right? And I can easily pick that out. Um, that's most of A, but missing that, that little bottom right corner, something along those lines. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a different color, right? And maybe I should have made this whole thing here um, that same color. Um, so I need the, the shading from, from the from the A part and the B complement that was the green and blue um, respectively, right? And so I know that A would be everything around A, so I'm going to include that boundary and on the inside of that, so that's going to be all of this stuff, right? And then I'm also including everything outside of B. Now that's where we've got to be a little careful. That edge right there, which is a little hard to see, um, maybe I can put that in a dot or something, That that's going to have to be dotted, right? Just that little piece. If I was going to kind of zoom in on this and just do it as a single, a single color, it might look something like, nope, I did a poor job on that, and, and iPad just decided to try to be smarter than what it is wanting it to be. So I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to have a dotted line coming up here, something like that, and then everything on the inside of that, something like that, almost this like Pac-Man shape where the where the inside mouth area there, the teeth, right, is that dotted line because we aren't including that. So that's a difference. And what I like about this particular one is it demonstrates that we oftentimes can get more complicated operations or more interesting operations using combinations or, or, or um, uh, uh, manipulations of previous concepts. So combinations of previous concepts. Here we have an intersect and a complement being brought together to give us this difference idea. A few more concepts that we'd like to think about related to sets. Um, there's an idea of uh, what is called mutual exclusivity between sets. Um, here we're going to look at a bigger grouping of sets. So I'm going to have a set A1, A2, all the way down to an AN. So there's cap N different sets that we've got here. Um, we can say that these sets A1 through AN are mutually exclusive, right? If and only if. Um, the intersection between any pair of those sets is equal to the empty set. So the intersection between AI and AJ is equal to the null set, right, whenever I is not equal to J. So if we're looking at two different sets taken out of this bigger group of sets, that they have no overlap, no overlap. Um, if I was going to maybe make a little picture, a Venn diagram type picture on something like this, I could maybe do something like this. I could draw my universe in there, something like that. Maybe here I have my A1, right? Um, to be mutually exclusive from A2, A2 has to be not including any part of A1. So right now as I've drawn it, A1 and A2 are mutually exclusive. I put in my A3, it's got to be somewhere else. There has to be no overlap between them. If I take any pair of them, like A2 and A3, right, the intersection between these guys, in this case, is the empty set, the null set. So mutual exclusivity means they have overlap that is just the empty set, no overlap, essentially. Disjoint is just a special case of mutual exclusivity. It's limited to the case of having two sets. So when we talk disjoint, it's between a set A and another set B, for example, um, just two things, and they are considered disjoint if their intersection is zero. So this is mutual exclusivity when cap N equals two is basically what this means. Um, we'll see later that mutual exclusivity is not the same as independence. Um, that's a frequent source of uh, confusion or misunderstanding. Um, there's a tendency sometimes to want to think of uh, mutual exclusivity as independence, and they, and they are definitely not the same concept. So I just want to lay a, a, an initial warning out there. Mutual exclusivity is different uh, from this later, later concept that we'll talk about that is independence. There's another one here called collectively exhaustive. Um, a collectively exhaustive set of sets, so A1 through AN again. So I've got A1 going all the way through AN, a total of N, cap N sets. Um, these guys are considered uh, collectively exhaustive, if and only if the union of all N of those objects gives me back the universe. 
Okay. So um, in this particular case, I'm going to show two different ways of doing this, and I'm going to do it with a Venn diagram. There's other ways of doing it, but let's look at a couple different ways. So here is going to be a set, a universal set. I'm just doing that with my rectangle, right? And I'm going to go ahead and draw in here some A1. So here's my A1, something along those lines. And I'm going to put in there next to it an A2, right? And I'm going to put next to it an A3. And in this particular case, we see that A1 union with A2, that means combine them together, union with A3, bring in A3 as well, they cover the entire S, right? There's nothing that's part of S that's not included in the union of all these guys together. They are collectively exhaustive. It turns out this particular example, so is it collectively exhaustive? Yes. Is it mutually exclusive? Also yes. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. It is also possible to get um, some sets that are um, collectively exhaustive, but do not satisfy that idea of mutual exclusivity. So I could draw something along those lines. I could come in here and draw another set, right? And let me go ahead and do it something like this. I could split it in half, right? I could take something like A1 over here, and then I could take something else, and I'm going to draw it like this, maybe just trying to emphasize that it's that other rectangle. Um, that's going to be A2, right? And then maybe I take this last little guy in here and I call that guy A3. We can see between A1, A2, and A3, they do cover all of S. So that is a collectively exhaustive set of sets. A1, A2, A3, all union together do give me S, the universe. However, you can see that A1 intersect A2 is not the empty set, right? There's that amount of overlap that I've shown in there, uh, now cross-hatched as black. Um, so those guys would not be mutually exclusive. So collectively exhaustive, yes. Mutually exclusive, no, they would not be. Okay, so we have some different uh, some different kinds of situations that can go. Um, this is a good place to introduce what are called generalized set notations. These generalized set notations, if you've seen um, something similar before in just some of the the um, generalized notations for um, addition and multiplication. We have a symbol that says sum up a bunch of elements. It's a gigantic a sigma sign, right? So you do something like this, sum up from i equals, let's say, m to n of some objects xi. Um, so that means add up a bunch of stuff together, right? You can also do things like a product. You use that big pi symbol, i equaling m to n of xi. That would be xm times xm plus 1 times all the way up until you hit x of n. So some, some type of uh, generalized addition and generalized multiplication symbols. We can do something very similar for both union and intersection. So I can do a generalized set notation or a general generalized union, set notation for a union, in the following way. I can use a gigantic U symbol, and I'm going to subscript it on the bottom, I equals M to N. So I'm going to go from M to N and take all the sets AI, uh, starting at M, right, all the way up to A sub N, and I'm going to union them all together. So that's this A sub M union, A sub M plus 1 union, all the way up to A sub N. That, of course, assumes that the N at the top of the U is a larger number than the M that's in the bottom of the U. So M, right, is less than or equal to n. If you had it swapped the other way, m greater than n, the notation typically just says uh, turn out an empty set. Um, so if for some reason you did, as an example, a union i equaling 3 to 2 of ai, I don't care what the ais are here, you would just get an empty set because 2 is smaller than 3. If you flopped it around the other way, you would get a2 unioned with A3, something along those lines. Generalized intersection works exactly the same. It's just now we use a big upside down U. It's going from M to N of some sets A sub I. It's just the intersection of all those guys as long as the um, thing up on top is bigger than the uh, number on the bottom. Otherwise, it's the empty set, something along those lines. Sets do provide powerful ways to describe regions or objects of interest. And so I'd like to look at just a few examples um, in this particular case of some sets and to make sure that we can understand them from these particular set notations. So I've already pre-written out some sets, um, A, B, and so forth, and um, they're described in terms of some coordinate pairs. And then we're going to see if we can come up with a graph that helps us understand what these sets look like. So let's see what we can do with this. The first one is a set A, which is a collection of coordinate pairs X and Y, so we can think of this being in the Cartesian plane, such that X plus J times Y is less than or equal to 1. Um, so X plus J, Y less than or equal to 1 really just describes a circle, right? So um, if I take a look at this guy, I can go ahead and look at the card. Whoops, that's not the one that I want. I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm working with the pen here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the Cartesian plane in here.
right? Something along those lines. And we can think of there being the x-axis, and we can think of there being the y-axis, something along those lines. And we want x plus jy. Well, what's the size of a complex number? It's x squared plus y squared square root. Um, that comes right out of trig. Um, so for those of you who remember some of your trig, this is all related to the idea of triangles. So x squared plus y squared, that radius, um, it's basically the size, um, the, the point in this in this Cartesian plane, has to have a, a radius or a distance um, less than or equal to 1. So I start out at the origin and I draw some vector up to a size 1. It could be at any angle. So there's a circle in there. It's a circle of radius 1. Any of those radiuses would work out. So we just get this big circle in there. Any point I pick in there. So for example, I take the origin. Is 0 plus j 0? Oops, and I forgot my magnitude signs in there. Is that magnitude, is that size less than or equal to 1? And yes, it is. So it has to be included in that set. If I did another one, like if I pick the value y equaling a half and x equaling 0, is 0 plus j 1 halves size, right, less than or equal to 1? Well, sure it is. If I look at the size there, it is a size of a half. I know that a half is less than or equal to 1, so that's also in there. If I pick something like this guy where I come out here at minus 1 and plus 1, so I pick this point out here, this is y equaling 1, x equaling minus 1, is minus 1 plus j1's size less than or equal, that's a question mark, of 1? Well, what's the size of minus 1 plus j1? Take the real part squared, that's 1. Take the imaginary part squared, that's also 1, square rooted. That's square root of 2, which is about, what, 1.4 something. That is not less than or equal to 1, so that's not included in my set, which is why that guy is not included in my set. So I've just done a graphical depiction here. In this particular case, I also need to know some stuff about um, complex numbers and the like. Um, so we do have to remember all that other math that we've learned in our lives, but um, a set notation, right, that describes a set of coordinates, right, that adhere to a particular condition. In this case, it's a, it's a kind of a nice way of describing a set of points that comprise a disk, right, of unit radius centered at the origin. The next set in here is B, and B is also going to be based in this coordinate plane. And so I'm going to look at this B. I'm going to go ahead and set up my coordinate plane. I have my X and I have my Y. And it says, hey, X is less than Y plus 1. Let's think about this more in just terms of the equality part. X equals Y plus 1. Could we draw that? You could rewrite that as Y equals X minus 1. This is the equation of a straight line, right? Y equals X, so slope is equal to 1, and it's got an offset. If you were kind of confused on this, throw in a value of X, like X equaling 0. What is Y? It's minus 1. So at X equals 0, Y equals minus 1. Pick something else, like X equals 1. 1 minus 1 gives me a Y value of 0. I've got two points on that line, and so I know that this line Line, right, that has a 45 degree slope, right, has a y intercept of minus 1, as we could have seen here, is that boundary line for this condition x less than y plus 1. Now I just need to decide which side of the line x being less than y plus 1 is. It's going to be one side of the line or the other. Well, just pick a point in and look at it. Let's take the origin. Let's take 0, comma 0. Is 0 less than 0 plus 1? Okay, is 0 less than 1? Yes, it is. So this point is included in this set that makes up B. Okay, so we are going to be including everything in there. I'm going to do it in yellow this time. It's all of this area over here, up to but not including that line, which why it's dotted, something along those lines. So I get a half plane here, right, that's bordered by this 45 degree slope line, something along those lines. I'm going to go ahead now and do a D. This set D is what? It's going to be based on these A and Bs before. So we had a couple of things that weren't too hard to get, and now we're making an even more complicated object um, out of out of some simple set operations that involve both a and b so a is just going to be left alone so we're going to continue sticking with this guy but what do we need to do we need to get b complement so if i think of b complement that's the stuff out here right so i come out here on the other side of the line that guy there is my b complement and it would have a hard boundary it'd have a straight boundary there that would be included because um, b itself did not include the boundary b complement will include the boundary something along those lines so i need to see what what of this part that I've shaded red intersects with this other part that was this unit circle? Well, this unit circle has this point, y equal minus 1 and x equaling 0, or this point here, x equaling 1 and y equaling 0. We know that's part of that boundary line. So that boundary line looks something like this, right? And that b complement is everything on that side of the line. 
And if we look at everything that is included in there, we should be getting this little kind of moon shape, something along those lines. So I can draw that guy out. I can do that in my coordinate planes if you like. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that in here. Maybe give myself this point minus one and this point here one is my, my starting points in here. And I'm just going to freehand it. If you were doing this for homework or something, you probably want to get a computer tool, something like MATLAB. And it's everything in between in there. So this guy is my D, something along those lines. We included A, which included its boundaries, and B complement also had the boundaries. So both of those guys would be um, included in this particular in this particular um, one, something along those lines. Now, if I go to my next one, E, E is the union between A and B. If I look back at what A was, A was that circle. B was that um, yellow looking piece um, that had a dotted line. If I union that, that means anything that includes both of those guys. That's also something I think we could probably just do um, pretty much from, from, from observation. So let's go ahead and put in that bounding line. So we know that there's this bounding line in there going something like this. And we also know that there is a circle um, that is part of our stuff in there. And I'm putting all these dotted right now because I haven't decided yet whether I need to include them or not. A is everything that's the circle and included, right? So that would be a full included of the circle, right? Something along those lines, all of this guy and everything inside. So we're gonna include all of this stuff. And then I need to increase this because it's a union with anything that was part of B. And I know B was anything not including that dotted line at a 45 degree slope. And that's up and to the left, something along those lines. So that's like all of this stuff over here. And what do we get out of all of that? If I clean that up a little bit and probably worth it in this case, let's come down here at those minus one, zero and zero one um, points in there, something like that. We know that there's a part here that's curved according to that circle that's gonna be included. And then we know that we have this dotted line going off like this. And then everything off to the left and above would be included in this. So if I, if I color all of this guy in something like that, right? We know that that whole thing there is E, something along those lines. The last one that I'm going to do that involves these sets is just a little bit different. Um, this particular one says, hey, let's let set F be equal to the set of coordinates X, Y, such that um, the coordinate set minus X minus 2 comma Y are parts of what we had already defined as D. D was that little moon shape guy, right? Well, um, usually we think of D in terms of its own coordinates. I'm going to call this guy some X prime and this guy some Y prime, something along those lines. If I take a pair of coordinate pairs, something like that, I can look at a little graph in here that has my X prime and Y prime. And I know what D looks like in that because we'd already drawn that. That was this stuff right here. Here was its, its horizontal or its first coordinate. We called that X prime, so I'm actually not going to draw that in there. And the vertical one was, oh, was the, the second coordinate, the Y part in there. So we're still going to have that guy. It's going to be, whoops, didn't want that to be uh, an eraser. I wanted this to be, I wanted this to be just whatever. It's just going to be that little kind of sliver moon piece, something like that. So that is like my D, right, in terms of X prime and Y prime. But what do I really need? I need things in terms of X and Y, and I know how X and Y connect to X prime and Y prime. Y is equal to Y prime, so there's going to be no change in that, nothing different in that. But my X does change, right? X prime is equal to minus X minus 2. That's a reflection and a shift. Probably the easiest way to figure out what happens here is just take a couple of interesting points. I'm going to draw draw these in red. Let's go ahead and pick this first one. What is this one? This is x prime being equal to what? 1. If x prime, and I forgot my prime over here. Here was my prime, right? If my x prime is equal to 1, I want to find out what value of x does that correspond to. This is equal to minus x minus 2. Solve for x. Bring x to the other side. I'm going to get x equals, and I'm going to have minus 2, and I'm going to subtract another one. That's going to be minus 3, something along those lines. So when I come in here and I have my x coordinate and my y coordinate, I know 1, 2, 3, minus that point right there, and I should have probably done that in red, right, is going to correspond to the red point that I had before. Y doesn't change, so it's still going to be on that horizontal axis. Let's do another one here. Let's do the blue one. Um, let's do that other, that other piece in there, uh, the other corner of that moon. That was at x prime equaling 0. So if I have my x prime, right, being equal to 0, and I'm solving for the corresponding value of x, that's going to be minus x minus 2, bring x to the other side, I get x equaling minus 2. So come over here at minus 2, right, here's my value minus 2, that should be giving me this blue one, but I know the blue y value, which didn't change because y prime is equal to y, is sitting down there at minus 1, so it's something like that. 
So what are we getting? Um, because of the minus sign here, we're getting a full reflection, right? And then we're getting a shift leftwards because of that minus two. I can fill in the rest now basically by, by observation. I know that I'm going to get this piece like that, and I know there's going to be this kind of moon shape like that. So a graphical depiction of like this, it's still a little moon shape, right? But it's been reflected and shifted over mostly because of this guy. And if you just do an accounting of points, you can certainly um, take care of that. We are um, running a little short on time here, so I'm looking at the clock. What I might do is I might copy these next ones over to the next lecture. We'll just uh, stop this uh, lecture here. It's a good point to stop. Uh, next time we will talk about basic set properties and, and work our way from there. So um, see you on the next lecture.